que hola, hola a todas, a todos. Muchas gracias por estar aquí. Eh, quisiera empezar agradeciendo a la organización de Tesis Digital, a la Dirección de Innovación Democrática del Ayuntamiento de Barcelona y al CCCB por haber hecho posible esta invitación a Nacensi World. La verdad es que eh, hemos tenido la suerte de contar con, con Nacensi para dos eventos. El primero de ellos fue el martes pasado en el CCCB. Estuvimos discutiendo con ella desde el colectivo Vector, eh, también el editor de Oriente. Eh, y la verdad que es un seminario muy fructífero, también muy largo eh, y salieron cosas súper interesantes. Y hoy tenemos la suerte de tener una charla con ella aquí en el marco del Destiny Fest. Y yo creo que será una conversación muy interesante porque también la comunidad que está alrededor del Destiny Fest tiene mucho que ver con, con la clase hacker, que es algo a lo que Magenti ha dedicado eh, mucho de su trabajo está dedicado a pensar esta clase. Creo que, que toda esta comunidad puede, se pueda sentir muy identificada con ello. Eh, así que muchísimas gracias eh, a, a Mackenzie Ward por la disponibilidad para hacer eh, estos dos eventos en tan poco tiempo durante su estadía. Y bueno, no quiero tomar mucho tiempo. Imagino que quizás muchas de ustedes ya conocen el trabajo de ella, otras otras no tanto. Entonces, voy a hacer como una pequeña presentación. Mackenzie Ward es profesora de. de Media Culture uh, en el New York uh, School for Social Research. Uh, ha publicado un montón de libros, son tantos que realmente no me va a dar el tiempo para nombrarlos a, a todos, pero uh, tiene un trabajo en el cual uh, ha generado uh, reflexiones en torno a la, a la interrelación entre tecnología, política, economía, género, ecología uh, y Simplemente por nombrar algunos, ha publicado Microsoft Hacker, Materia Gamer, Molecular Red, que es materia para el antropoceno, El Capitalismo Muerto, que está recientemente traducido por Olovión, que es uno de los libros que estuvimos discutiendo en el CCD con Gary. Seguramente hoy también saldrán ideas de, de este libro. Eh, y los más recientes, Real Scout Earth y Centoria, que creo que hemos discutido ninguno de los dos en el CCD. Y yo creo que una de las cosas más interesantes de, del trabajo de Word es que eh, ella como que nos eh, incita a, a, a tener una sensibilidad o a estar atentas frente a las realidades emergentes, ¿no? Eh, y en ese sentido, eh, presta mucha atención a las prácticas, a las técnicas, a las culturas técnicas. Lo digo en sentido amplio y digo tecnologías, ¿no? Las prácticas están muy relacionadas con las técnicas, no solo las tecnologías y las técnicas, eh, bueno, que involucran también modos de vida, formas eh, de experiencia, ¿no? Eh, y, 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 en, y en este invitarnos a, a, a mirar allí, ella, eh, una de las cosas que creo que pone sobre la mesa de trabajo es no asumir que, que las cadenas que, eh, a las que estamos sometidas eh, son cadenas que ya conocemos o que se van a mantener siempre igual. Y es decir, esa es la forma de, de desencadenarnos o de liberarnos de ciertas restricciones en relación a, pues, a la tecnología o a, o a otras cuestiones como la política. Eh, no las podemos dar por sentadas de algún modo. ¿no? Eh, y en este sentido, la, bueno, la conciencia de, de clase es algo esencial para poder eh, salir de una de, de estas limitaciones. Eh, pero ella plantea las cosas en un aspecto en el que antes de, de preguntarnos en qué clase social estamos y en qué clase social pertenecemos, tenemos que hacernos la pregunta de en qué sistema de producción pues, estamos viviendo. Y eso implica, eh, a pesar de la resistencia que puede generar esta pregunta, tanto de la derecha como de la izquierda, eso implica permitirnos preguntarnos si... Eh, las relaciones de producción que se establecen a través de las tecnologías digitales eh, hacen que sigamos en el mismo sistema de producción si seguimos en el capitalismo o no. Aceptar que el capitalismo puede ser eh, una realidad que no es una, una esencia inmutable eh, y que en ese sentido podemos devolver esta categoría a su sentido eh, 
teórico y comprender que puede llegar a tener un principio y un fin, decir, el fin eh, que es lo que, lo que viene, ¿no? <risa> lo que viene después es algo peor, quizás. Eh, esta pregunta está llena de otras preguntas, ¿no? ¿Qué tipo de nuevas eh, formas de propiedad intelectual son aquellas que están siendo adoptadas por, por las clases dominantes? Eh, ¿Qué tipo de comunes eh, están siendo dominados por asimetrías de poder? Eh, y finalmente, ¿qué posibilidades de hackear esa propiedad privada que se hace cada vez más abstracta, ¿no? Y esa propiedad privada se hace más abstracta eh, en casos en relación a, a este tipo de tecnologías. Eh, así que, bueno, yo no me voy a extender mucho más porque hay poco tiempo. Eh, tendremos intervención en inglés y una de las cosas que quería decir es que hay traducción simultánea, entonces se pueden acercar a, a pedir eh, pues, eh, el dispositivo para, para poder ir viendo la charla y la traducción no sé si está el catalán o al castellano. Eh, y luego habrá me, bueno, media hora de presentación en la Kenzi Work y luego abre, abriremos la ronda de preguntas. ¿vale? So, thank you very much. We can start with the presentation. See if this works. Slide, yeah, that would be stuff there. Um, my thanks to uh, Jesse Dean for uh, having me. My thanks to uh, Alejandra for the introduction. Uh, I do apologize that uh, I can only address you in English. Uh, most of uh, the material I'm drawing on is in these two books, which are both available in Spanish. Uh, I have a manifesto, it's 15 years old, and a, a couple of speeches just came out uh, in Spanish. Uh, thanks to uh, Olivia. All right, let's have a go. All right, so what I've got time to do is uh, try to sort of frame with a, a sort of a, a big picture how we might think about the contemporary struggles around information that we're stuck with today. And the, the provocation that I want to start with is the uh, uh, subtitle of the English edition of uh, Capital is Dead. Uh, what if this isn't even capitalism anymore, but we're living in something worse? So maybe the uh, language that we're using, the conceptual tools, the forms of organizing, maybe there's reasons they sometimes don't get purchased, is that we're actually looking at something that, at least at the top level, uh, is a slightly different kind of social technical apparatus than the, the one that we were taught to think we might be living inside of. So, Let's just sort of take that as a, a thought experiment, a provocation. What if it's not capitalism anymore? Is something worse? Then what are, what are the consequences of that for popular and democratic organizing? Would that give us like a reframing of how our activities, uh, how our struggles, how our, uh, our alliances, how the contradictions might, might have picked a slightly different picture of all of that? So that's, that's what I want to sort of do a little bit today. All right, so the basic idea uh, in the uh, uh, two books that I'm referring to here would be to see history as, uh, modern history as commodification that took place in three stages, where those stages were each qualitatively a little bit different. So stage one is the commodification of the means of agricultural production. I mean, sometimes we leave that bit out, but maybe that's sort of a little bit separate to capitalism as a kind of industrial system. The transformation of uh, a sort of a peasant economy where there's sort of reciprocal relations with the nobility into tenant farmers who are paying rent to a landlord class that's been able to extract rent based on the monopolization of the ownership of land is a whole stage in development of the abstraction of commodification. Land is a sort of a, a somewhat fixed commodity, if you like. It's a particular place. It has particular uh, productivity and so forth. Uh, capitalism sort of transforms that. It's, it's abstract in a more general sense. It's like you can be anywhere. The, the system of distribution 
but capitalism is the development of ways of uh, owning the means of production as private property. Uh, and it creates a kind of different subordinate class to the tenant farmer on the land. It creates the working class. And the commodification uh, of land uh, through a surplus population off the land into the city that then, because they have nothing to sell but their labor, those workers become subordinated to a capitalist class. This is the traditional story as we have it in Marx, yeah? But what I want to add to that is, what if there's a third stage in the abstraction of the commodity form that is different again? It has to do with the commodification, not of land, not of capital in the sense of the factory and the means of production, but in the sense of information. And what does it mean for the top level of economic domination to be about control for information, control for information of capital, of land, and where you're producing not two, but then three subordinate classes, and a relationship between not two, landlords and capitalists, but three uh, kinds of ruling class. The more recent one is then controlling for information. So that's the sort of basic argument of the book. And let's say, let's take it as a thought experiment. Um, we sort of have gotten into the habit of thinking that uh, capitalism is sort of something that's kind of eternal. We just modify it a little bit, and it's still basically the same thing. So we had Fordist capitalism, and post Fordist capitalism, and neoliberal capitalism. At what point does it become something that's qualitatively different? That's the question that I want to ask. So as I'm suggesting, maybe there's specific forms of class conflict specific to each era in the evolution of the uh, abstraction of the commodity form. So the first version of that is farmers versus landlords, and the, the typical forms of resistance uh, that uh, farmers were able to articulate their interests of the class had against the landlord class, which tended to involve uh, uh, burning down the manor, that kind of thing. Then we had workers versus capitalists, the, the introduction of the tactic of the strike, for example, uh, or sabotage, other ways you can interrupt the flow of production at the side of production to be able to make demands on the, from the point of view of uh, subordinate class of, of workers. But what that depended on the being choke points in how uh, capitalist organization of manufacturing work. So if you shut down the railway or you blockade the factory, you can interrupt the circuit of production. But maybe that's a little harder in an era when the whole of, of production, distribution, consumption is organized through flexible systems of information that you can move around the possibilities of labor to organize itself. And you can also outsource production away from where, wherever labor happens to be. And maybe that's one of the big stories about the 70s is capital starts to outsource production, so you just, just withdraw production from labor that's resisting you and put it somewhere else. But maybe in the process, uh, investing so heavily in the means of information control, that information control itself became uh, a means of domination, even over capital itself. So what if there's a new kind of ruling class added on top of the other two? I call it vectorless class. I mean, call it what you like. I'm not with it to this language. Uh, the, the word vector, common to most European languages, just means a line of six lengths with no fixed position. And we can think of everything to do with information as working like that, yeah? There's a certain set of properties that communicating with a cell phone has that it works anywhere. I can connect to uh, any point in the sort of information sphere with this device. So the fixed qualities of the flexibility of information as a means of communication and control is the thing that maybe reshapes the whole of production, consumption, distribution, and so on. And that's the thing that I want to sort of get at here. So what if at the top level, control of a political economy, control of surveillance, uh, what if all of those things was now in the space of, let's call it a vector field, where you're tracking the movement of raw materials, of finished goods, of labor, of the consumer, 
pretty much in real time as it moves through the entire cycle of extraction, uh, production, distribution, consumption, and then the movement of social reproduction of workers through the rest of their lives. Because, you know, I, I hate to tell you, you probably already know that these things, just walking around with it is, is throwing off streams of data to who knows how many companies uh, that have access to the data that you're producing just by walking around. So, what is at the top level the way the ruling class now works is through the extraction of surplus information. And then what is the design of that information system is really just only for the purpose of extracting surplus information out of all of this. So, we're often told that these things are for our convenience, that they create uh, a public sphere or so forth, but they're really not. They're not really designed for us. They're designed to get something out of us. So, I think that poses a lot of questions about why it's been so badly designed and why the information sphere doesn't work the way it's advertised as supposedly working. So, if the information systems that we're embedded in are designed really just to extract surplus information out of us, that might account for why they don't work very well for democracy, they don't work very well for culture, why we end up in endless kind of uh, Twitter fights, why we have so much disinformation, it's not really designed to do anything other than extract surplus information out of us. And to extract surplus information not just out of labor, but out of non-labor, which is a somewhat paradoxical idea, like what's non-labor? Uh, so even when I'm not working, I'm still working for the man, so to speak. I'm still producing information uh, for, you know, Google or Apple or, or whoever, uh, who's then able to, uh, uh, by giving me little bits of information that I wanted, but extracting all of the information in the aggregate out of all of us, and then be treating that as proprietary and being able to shape corporate strategies based on that. That might be the world that we're now in. So it's an unequal information exchange. Uh, it's teams I get for free, uh, the location of this venue so I could find it on the subway, uh, or the time of my flight tomorrow. I get little bits of information, but all of us in aggregate are producing information for a ruling class that doesn't give it up to us, that treats it as, as its own private property. And maybe it's not just our labor that gets demonified now, but what I'm going to semi-seriously call our communism is the thing that gets commodified uh, 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 and, and taken away from us. So our desire to share, to be with others, to have community, uh, to make things freely available to each other, that's the very thing that now gets commodified. So paradoxically, the very possibility of, of small c communism, the things we want to share and give to each other outside of the commodity, is the very thing that now gets commodified. So what happens uh, if we want counter strategies to that? How do we work in that environment? Are there ways that uh, traditional forms of uh, social and cultural and political organizing uh, and this new environment might meet? You know, what, what, what are the possibilities for what that we might want in relation to that? So part of the problem is a kind of outflanking of the traditional forms of popular organization, such as unions, parties, cooperatives, social movements. We still have those, but I think we maybe share a common sense that uh, the political parties are sort of shells of, them form, of their former selves. Uh, it gets harder to organize unions and to organize uh, around labor. Uh, the, the cooperative becomes something else, becomes a different kind of organization. And it becomes difficult to use the traditional tactics that popular movements used to use. Uh, what's a strike in relation to information? Like, what's an information strike? It seems hard to sort of think that. Now, of course, there are still real strikes. You could shut down production at a particular place. But that's not helpful if there's a system of information that could all route around uh, the particular blockage that you're trying to affect with the strike. Uh, we can still demonstrate, but does demonstrating still actually work? You can still occupy a physical place. But uh, uh, in, in uh, America, we have the slogan, Occupy Wall Street. But how do you occupy an abstraction? Like, Wall Street's not really a physical place. It's a sort of metaphor for 
the global circulation of capital at the speed of light, how do you occupy that? So you could symbolically occupy a space near Wall Street, called Sukkoti Park. Uh, uh, 20 years, uh, how long ago? 10 years ago today? Sorry, not 20. <laughs> uh, so you can, you can symbolically occupy it, but you can't really occupy it. And frankly, it's got to be said, riot is still a strategy, particularly in relation to uh, information policing. Uh, in the context of the United States, this is heavily racialized. Uh, the use of violence uh, by the police provokes the refusal to be police uh, in the form of uh, civil unrest, right? Uh, so it's a strategy that you can use to some extent, but the means of surveillance of populations who are attempting that are ever more intricate than they used to be before. Uh, during uh, Black Lives Matter in New York City, the NYPD uh, arrested 400 people crossing Brooklyn Bridge and then released them without charges. And my suspicion is the reason they did that was just to gather data to find out uh, what a sample of the population who were protesting was for the purposes of surveillance and intelligence, right, rather than to really arrest anybody. So it gets hard to use traditional forms of uh, political and social organization. So we can think about temporary measures uh, in relation to the situations we find ourselves in. Uh, and quite frankly, I, I can't even learn how it's done in uh, Catalonia and Barcelona because it seems that some of the strategies around this here are more advanced than ones I'm familiar with in the United States. But we can figure out uh, experiments in combining traditional forms and tactics with the available uh, contemporary social media. So we learn a lot from uh, Occupy Wall Street, from the Arab Spring, from Black Lives Matter, from Nados here, and so on. About uh, you get one moment where you can outflank uh, the police by using a new tool, but you don't get two moments to do that. If you organizing around Facebook before they figure out that you can do it, it'll work for a while, then they figure out you're using Facebook and you'll be under surveillance, full of disinformation, uh, uh, sort of, uh, um, you know, false flag operations, that sort of thing. So you only get to do it once. Uh, and I think we learned particularly from uh, Arab Spring. I had a, a graduate student who did work on that. Uh, uh, you know, the, the security agencies are tools, and they figure this out pretty quickly. Uh, and the thing we know is that a lot of these corporate platforms are going to cooperate uh, very readily with uh, the security apparatus and very quickly. So you don't get very long to use a, a new tool. Maybe there's like five minutes where you could use TikTok for organizing before anybody figures out you're doing it, and, and then you'll get shut down. Maybe you'll be stuck for a minute, and then you have to move on to something else. Yeah. Uh, and, and remember, of course, none of these tools are really designed for these purposes in the first place, so they're, they're not going to work very well uh, for doing that. But we'll do our best, right? So I'm pointing to some of the limitations that the existing uh, design of not just social media, but the entire kind of uh, information apparatus. It's really there to extract surplus information out of populations, out of flows of goods, out of flows of capital, flows of derivatives. None of it's built for us. It's built to extract something out of us. So it's readily available for uh, surveillance, uh, and that has a, a, a chilling effect, a dampening effect on people's willingness to participate. And one can get very paranoid about that. Uh, the powers that be don't really usually care about any of this individually, but they might be looking for patterns in how people are responding to uh, forms of oppression or, or exploitation. Uh, you get a lot of noise. If anybody's been on social media, you know that most of it is noise, uh, that you're, you're dealing with stuff that's seeming random and poorly sourced, uh, and, is, and is going down, you know, sort of rabbit holes of useless information around anything. A lot of it is unverified and unverifiable. Who knows if any of these things are true? Conspiracy theories become very popular. Uh, there's a, a conspiracy theory that uh, Australia, where I come from, doesn't exist because the Earth is flat and there's no southern hemisphere. Uh, so I'm a paid agent at NASA, uh, and the reason this happened is because uh, the British Empire didn't really transport us there. It just threw us overboard from the ships, and this is so scandalous that we've had to lie about it for two centuries.
Ministries. Uh, so thank you, NASA. The, I assume the check is in the mail. To, to <laughs> and and, and uh, uh, my pupils aren't real. They're all carefully engineered in some lab in Area 51. And obviously, this is an extreme example, and very few people believe this. But you understand that, you know, the temptation to believe these things is probably quite real because we often feel like the consensus reality that we're in doesn't really seem to add up. So people go to these kind of extreme versions of thinking there must be something else that's real and true. So noise, disinformation, uh, there's probably a lot of intentionally seeded disinformation and a lot of paranoia about that. I don't know about here, but in the last election cycle in the United States, there's like huge paranoid conspiracy theory that the Russians are subverting the American elections. It's like, I thought subverting other people's elections was what the CIA did, right? Like, I think America's really good at that, but then there's this whole thing about, well, other people are subverting our election, like, as if that's not supposed to happen, you know? But uh, if you say in English, turn around, stay play, yeah? I don't know if the, how true those rumors are or how much uh, influence, you know, like, Russian disinformation really had. Uh, and of course, most of this is unverifiable. How do you verify information in this environment? So how do we use the media design to extract a surplus promise to organize against it becomes a kind of significant problem. And then one starts to deal with the noisy dynamics of an information sphere, find ways of seeding it with particular means, but you have very little agency and control over them. So there's probably a whole series of tactics for doing that, and ways in which a great deal of uh, organizing really still has to happen with real people in, in real spaces, yeah. Uh, I don't know if anybody here has heard of um, an American politician called uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, uh, who became the sort of standard bearer of the uh, social democratic left within the Democratic Party in the United States. I'm from the district that she represents. And the way that that campaign worked was, was literally knocking on people's doors rather than relying on a media campaign like all of the other candidates did. So the various progressive organizations literally went door to door, you know, talking to people, finding out what issues mattered to people. So sometimes, you know, it's, it's not the, the new shiny internet strategy that's going to work. Sometimes it's real physical organizing that's going to make a real difference. But clearly, we need to think about what would be forms of uh, information, uh, circulation, uh, management that would be appropriate for forms of self-organization. So how do we think about uh, information in terms of self-defense? So is that popular movements, and even just people in everyday lives, uh, people from minority cultures, I'm, I'm one as a trans woman. I kind of need a little bubble. I need a little space where we can have information where we're not continually under attack. So, what could we do about designing tools for democratic, popular, uh, or minority organization? And maybe those tools would start to look different uh, to the ones that were provided that are really just there to extract information from us. But there's a second piece to this. Uh, it's one thing to think about people, uh, you know, what I call the hacker class, you know, people who specialize in creating and organizing information. It's one thing to think of people from that class to which I belong, making a contribution to the design of better tools and the creation of new forms of uh, information uh, uh, regulation for all of us. But one has to think the other side of that as well. How do we let the democratic process into the design of those tools as well? So those, those of us who think we understand the form and content of information aren't just acting like experts who come from without. How do we change our working methods so that those, those of us who specialize in the design of information, form and content are working with people who are communities, who have issues, who are social movements, to sort of break down that difference. And I think that's one of the main uh, issues and struggles at the moment is to, is to sort of bridge those sorts of gaps uh, between different kinds of knowledge, different kinds of ways of working, uh, different kinds of expertise. And to recognize that everybody's got expertise about how culture can work, how communication can work. 
Uh, I want to say a little bit about uh, information ecology, and particularly ecologies of attention. The thing about information is there always seems to be just too much of it. Like, information is everywhere. Uh, of, of the thousands of things I could occupy my time with on my phone, what do I pick? I really try to read the New York Times, which is a reasonably good newspaper, but I spend half my time on Twitter. Um, just like shit posting, basically. I don't know how you translate shit posting in Spanish. I hope that was, <laughs> there's a local equivalent of that one. But, uh, so, you know, my attention gets, gets sort of distracted for things that, that seem sort of unimportant, but which manage my, you know, sort of emotional well-being, maybe. Uh, and I want to borrow a little bit from uh, my friend Yves Souton, who talks about four kinds of attention, and to think about the way that the media sphere operates in relation to those four kinds of attention. And he calls them alertness, loyalty, projection, and immersion. And we sort of need all of them, and none of them are necessarily bad, but that we sometimes end up in information systems much more designed around alertness and loyalty than around projection and immersion. And so maybe we need to think about rebalancing our attention and then designing together tools that help with that rebalancing. So loyalty as a kind of attention sort of hypnotizes us into thinking, but that's where I belong, I'm the same as that, I belong with those people. So I'm paying attention because that's the thing I want to belong to or want to identify with. Identity politics is all about that, that's my people, and those are not my people. Like the, the, the downside of loyalty is you're sort of thinking about somebody else as the enemy. So it's, it's kind of can be galvanizing that you're connected to something, but you're then not attending to certain other subtleties and certain other problems. And I can connect to alertness. Uh, I don't know if you have anything like Fox News in the Spanish context, but if anybody's seen Fox News in America, it's always like, you really should be worried about this thing. This thing is terrible. They're, they're going to ban Christmas. There's transgender people everywhere, and they're a menace. They're going to do this, and they're going to, you don't allowed to use this word anymore. So it's all like hyper alertness all the time. Like all of these things are scary. So it's a very particular kind of attention that gets you tense and that you focus. And you can insert the advertising in the middle of that. It's no accident a lot of these uh, hyper right wing media sites advertise gold. Yeah, you're supposed to think by gold because you're so paranoid about the world, you know, like they're going to come and get us, so we better get gold, you know. So there's a way in which it's kind of like bad attention. It's obviously just aimed at extracting surface information out of us, selling us some useless stuff. I mean, what are you supposed to do with the gold? It's not like you can eat it. So maybe we need to balance our attention a little bit and think about uh, immersion rather than think I'm separate from the world, so I'm alert or scared of it. How am I immersed in the world as a form of attention where I can let go of my barriers a little bit and belong to something, participate in something? Yeah? Uh, how can I uh, have a kind of attention that projects me into something else where I'm no longer caught up in being myself? I'm like, oh, I can imagine what it would be like to be someone else, or more interestingly, something else, yeah? I'll come back to this, but how does it feel to be something else, not just someone else? So I get out of that sense of I have to be alert to dangers around my own boundaries, yeah? And, and sort of only, like, wedded to the people I feel who kind of, are kind of like me. So maybe one thing we could think about when we're designing not just the actual sort of, like, the tools and the, the technical part, of alternative communication, but the culture of it, yeah? Like, what's the sort of cultural space we're trying to create where it might have elements of all of those? And what we might need to switch between them. In the middle of crisis, maybe alertness is a good thing, and you don't want to be all relaxed and, and immersed when there's an actual crisis happening. But how do we know the crisis is real? And maybe we could use our immersive and, and projective ability to see whether the crisis is actually real or if we're just getting scared and paranoid for no reason because it suits some, you know, sort of branch of the ruling class to make us feel that way. So the media that we're operating in don't really balance those four kinds of attention because some are easier to exploit for the purpose of extracting surface information and selling us useless stuff than others are. 
So we don't really have an information ecology that's designed for us to feel good about ourselves, let alone be able to organize ourselves. So yeah, like we all then start to feel terrible. So then we're all often with a bunch of commodities and things to make us feel better. So you get hooked on buying more stuff. So what would it mean to create cultures and media vectors that work with them, that enable us to live richer, fuller lives, but also to be able to self-organize around popular demands against exploitation, against oppression? That would, I think, be the, you know, sort of the, the big question in not just media theory, but media practice at the moment. So we have uh, an information economy, an attention economy, trying to grab the pull on for our attention because attention is scarce. We don't have an information ecology, and that's the thing we might want to start to think about. Because we end up in these feedback loops. Uh, positive feedback loops sounds like a good thing, it's not. Positive feedback loops are bad thing because it gets more hyper and more and more. Uh, so we get. I'm, I'm sort of alert, so that makes me scared, that makes me sort of loyal to a little narrow group, and then that makes me more alert, and, and you end up in this cycle that's, that's going to sort of drive you crazy. All right, so I'm at 30 minutes, and I'm going to wrap it up in just a second. All right. So, yeah, what, how do we get out of that by designing things a little differently? Some, some points towards that, balancing forms of attention, which I've expanded on a little bit because I think that's a little bit of a, a slightly counterintuitive one, maybe a slightly different one. And these other ones, I think, are probably fairly uh, well known if you've been thinking about any of these issues. How do we encourage participation, not just in terms of reach, but quality of participation without requiring everybody to uh, uh, spend all of their time? As uh, Oscar Wilde once said, the problem with socialism is it takes too many evenings. Yeah. How, how do we not spend all of our time in endless meetings to have some efficiency around that? Verification and trust. How do we establish trust in relation to each other? And that's where being physically present, co-present is very helpful. And I thought COVID has given us some new problems to think about around that. Negative feedback is actually a good thing. Even if it's got the word negative in it. Negative feedback is that damping down. You know, something, some information spiral is happening. How do we unspiral it when everyone's getting paranoid about some particular thing? And how do we create forms of decision making that are inclusive, inclusive but not endless? It's not that endless series of evenings. To what extent can any of these ideas scale? Uh, that's the hard one. And that's where I think. If you're doing experiments on the local scale and the municipal scale and networking those, might be the way to, to go about that, to think that. Uh, so the, the you know, municipal socialism is an old idea, but maybe we could sort of update that in terms of municipal information socialism. So at that scale, it's maybe quite possible that the people have leverage, whereas at the national scale and certainly at the global scale, you have less. And then that would allow experiments with forms that what happens in Madrid is different to what we're working on in Barcelona, is different to what we're working on in New York, and then how do we learn from each other and have networks of learning together about that. Uh, I just want to gesture a little bit to so far I'm just talking about people and techniques, but we're living in the Anthropocene, like climate change is real. I don't know about here, but it's just been ridiculously hot for October in New York City, and that's probably not good. So how, how do we think about information coming from outside the human as being part of how we regulate and manage, particularly if we're increasingly in an era of the instability of certain conditions we take for granted about how we pass through our daily life? So ecologies of information that include the non-human. So what would a struggle for a flexible, democratic, sustainable information sector look like that includes alliances of all the subordinate classes, that isn't just restricted to the human but is thinking beyond it? That's, if you like, the sort of big picture that I'm trying to, to paint here a little bit. And I 
sorry about all the new words, but that's my, so I think that's my job, just make up words and see if you like them, you know, it's like, like poetry that works for a dozen pedal leaders. Uh, the thing about, like, architecture is that both built form and information, but there's something a little bit sort of fixed and solid about thinking architecture, so I bring the word architecture as a way to think about what we might need to now build. build. Uh, Kindness is a word that means not just uh, a new thing happening, but a qualitatively new thing happening in time. What if we're in a different kind of time now? And the common name to criticize it for that is the Anthropocene. So what's the time of the Anthropocene? And I want to argue that what we're experiencing is the geological time that's moving faster than historical time. So the weather is changing faster than our politics is or our technology is. And that's kind of alarming. So maybe we need to think about flexible, adaptable, uh, resilient, robust ways that we can organize and use the kind of communication tools available to us to build something other than a vector that just extracts information out of it. Uh, I'm going to do a plug for my, the other people who invited me here, which is the CCTV has a great show uh, called uh, Science uh, Fictions uh, or Frictions to sort of think through exactly that problem of how do we include things other than human actors and technology in our thinking about this. Great show, I recommend it. And that's basically all I've got to say. So uh, uh, for those who uh, uh, maybe, uh, and I Really, thank the translator, and I uh, hope I wasn't running too fast. Uh, I hope some of that makes sense. I hope some of it connects to the context. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to be here and learn about the work that's been happening in Barcelona, uh, in Catalonia, and in Spain, uh, Spain as well, uh, and uh, more on all these topics in those two books. That's all for me. Thank you.
course modification and okay, the word class based on extracting information. So there's a way that public infrastructure is sort of like a, a counter to that. And sometimes public infrastructure can partially be to modify some relations. But the problem with that, and, and I'm coming at this from living in the United States for a long time as well, uh, public infrastructure often ends up captured by uh, ruling class and, and unions of modification that hold it out from the inside. Uh, but they can also be uh, subject to uh, kind of uh, forms of political control that are helpful either. So how do you have public infrastructure that's then at the same time uh, uh, something that you can put pressure on from social movements to maintain its mission? So we end up, for example, with public health that really is public health and not just being hollowed out for the benefits of, uh, you know, the drug companies, uh, but then also not under pressure from uh, right-wing groups who want to ban certain procedures because their main interest is the control of the money. Uh, so that's sort of the tension around that. So it's, it's you know, public infrastructure is not a sort of, uh, uh, a solution that's completely going to work without maintaining that sort of popular pressure on it to make sure that it meets a diverse range of needs and is open to some kind of democratic oversight and management. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we need to rethink uh, for politics uh, to meet also uh, yeah. Yeah, in order to make So yeah, I, I mean, in, in the United States, we don't have uh, our public health system, it's all privatized. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the big demands is let's build it, and that would actually be a big improvement in the United States. But then, for someone like me, I look at uh, what's going with, on with public health in Britain, mm -hmm. where for trans people seeking treatment, the waiting list is four years to get a first appointment. Mm -hmm. So there's a level of uh, uh, interference with the delivery of of regular health care to a particular group around a political agenda that oppresses them. Mm -hmm. But there's only one national system, so you're kind of trapped in it. So sometimes public systems aren't in the interest of particular minorities. Mm -hmm. So uh, so they're generally a big thing, but with that one caveat, the one has to, you, know, you have to be open to that kind of pressure. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. So thank you very much for that answer. I don't want to take too much space for the debate, so maybe we can have some questions um, of, of the audience. Does anyone come here? The microphone's not to you. <laughs> thank you. It's been, it's been awesome. Thank you to, to you two. And I was... Um, it really resonates. I don't know if, if you've heard about this, this, this recent work of uh, artist Ben Grosse called uh, Minus, Minus, which is basically um, a social network that where you can post only 100 times. So it's like it's kind of a degrowth uh, social network playing with, at, like, giving another value to the attention. Given the design of the platform, no? it was to me it was like kind of mind blowing, and it was I was kind of wondering how can we like and, uh, apply the logics of the growth uh, to to technological ecosystems, and especially uh, regarding to to attention and, and addiction. I, I have heard of that work, but I love that. Um, I should probably try it because I think I'm up to like 20,000 Twitter posts at this point. <laughs> this is complete, like, you know, like mind suck of my attention. Uh, yeah, and, but how can uh, different modes of attention be pleasurable rather than thinking there's some, some, some kind of duty or. Yeah, I, I think that's sort of the challenge. It's like, how do you create other pleasures around attention? Uh, and, and there's a sort of educational part in that as well. You know, sometimes we just, we're, we're deprived of the education in, in the kinds of attention that might give us pleasures we don't know about. Uh, so there's, there's a role for education in that as well, I think. But, um, you know, I, I had a very provincial uh, upbringing, but I was just lucky I had people took me to, uh, to see art. And, and, and 
space, but also taught me how to look at it. Uh, so how do we, how do you, you know, create that so that we can sort of get off what my colleague Beckwith's class wants us to do with attention, and get us onto other kinds of attention, but we'll find equally pleasurable rather than thinking they're sort of achievement. encounter a new vector or a new source of information or a new app or something, what what questions do you ask to understand and to, like, to protect yourself from all the things that you were presenting about? <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense. To, to, to really understand the healthy way to intake information, I guess. Yeah, I'm not going to claim my ways of interacting with any of these things is healthy at all. Uh, and I, I'm a little resistant. I think there's sort of like a, uh, like a middle class thing about, you know, that I have the responsible way of doing these things, you know. Uh, and, and I don't want to play that card. So uh, I'm like a complete sucker for, you know, uh, ridiculous, you know, ways of interacting on the internet that give me pleasure and allow me to, you know, like make friends. And, uh, so, I haven't done TikTok, but I probably will, uh, you know, because it's like, oh, like, but, but I, I do want to ask a set of formal questions about it, because I'm for media studies. So, I think the trick, uh, it, this is like, to me, the, the standing idea of media theory is look at the form, not the content. Uh, so, you open TikTok, I've looked at it, I don't, don't use it regularly, it's like, oh, okay, so it's funny videos, and it's teenagers dancing, it's a thing that works well on it. Uh, they are interested in the form, and that would be things like uh, it's an algorithm that seems um, heavily skewed towards identifying what's popular and then like massively circulating one popular thing rather than a hundred. So it's, it's very close to a broadcast model. TikTok is sort of, um, you know, extracting possibilities mostly from teenagers doing dances and things like that then picking one, and that's the popular one. And it does that more heavily than Twitter does or Facebook does. So I try to understand the form of it uh, to get a little bit past the content of it. And I think that's like a useful kind of device to see how that works. Um, but not to be um, too um, self-punishing about one's own desires for, for pleasure in media. But that even to use that as ways of thinking about how does this form work to extract information out of it? Eh, gracias. Yo quería preguntar un poco. Mm, pensaba en que los tres tipos de contradicción de las que hablabas eh, de los de las clases, ¿no? Los campesinos y terratenientes, eh, trabajadores y capitalistas y hackers y vectoralistas, es como que los seis están todavía existiendo y hay una interacción entre las contradicciones que se operan entre las tres, ¿no? Y si podías tú un poco desarrollar esto, ¿cómo, cómo entiendes que operan estas uh, tres contradicciones a la vez? Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you for that because I skipped over that part uh, fairly quickly. And so I'm not saying that those old class contradictions went away at all. Um, um, most people in the world are probably workers or farmers. I don't know which of those is the bigger part at the moment. And there's arguments among sociologists about that. But most people farm or work. Yeah. Most people are in you know, some sort of landlord system or in capitalism. It's more a question of is there a dominant uh, or an attempt to dominate that with a more abstract kind of ruling class control? And is that dependent on a new subordinate class that's pulling up the class? That's the producer of new information in, in the form of content. But if you think about it as that matrix of six classes, which is already still a bit of a simplification, right? I've left out the managerial class and I've left out the petite bourgeois you know, sort of self-trader. I've left various pieces of it out to create a fairly simple diagram. 
but even just with six classes, three dominant, three subordinate, you've got a very complicated political matrix. And for me, this is the beauty of uh, the political writings of Marx. In, in capital, Marx is trying to talk about a two-class system for most of it. Uh, but in the political writings, Marx is trying to understand, oh, so Napoleon Bonaparte was, was operating with, you know, this incredibly complicated, you know, multi-class dynamic. And then Antonio Gramsci builds on that. So there's ways in which you can form different kinds of class alliance. There's ways in which you can attempt to mitigate the frictions that happen between worker, farmer, hacker, because they, you know, culturally they're quite different universes. So how do you kind of cross that so that people can organize? Uh, maybe there's times you can exploit the tensions between different kinds of ruling class. Uh, you know, like capital is, is, is now trying to struggle to regain control over the production process. Uh, it's interesting the struggle of uh, big Chinese companies that used to be manufacturers are trying to get control of information to make products under their own name. Yeah? So there's, there's ways in which you end up with a, a, a kind of complicated diagram to try to work it in. Uh, and I think that the political tactics come out of that to try to sort of seek out alliances and exploit contradiction. You've got the easy example of the um, uh, victory of Alexandria Castro Cortez in my little district. That was very much about, in my terms, a sort of worker hacker alliance. So, service workers who are mostly Spanish speaking, where I'm from, like often from uh, Colombia, uh, but who face housing insecurity and, and uh, don't have access to health care. How can they be in alliance with a sort of much more educated, wider English speaking uh, group of, you know, hacker class people who have this massive student debt? They're actually not really making all that much more money because they've kind of serviced this huge amount of debt. So how can they have common interests around, we want socialized medicine, we want rent control. Like rent control is something both of those classes shared in as a common issue. So there was a way that it was the right candidate and the right slogans to get these communities that in a lot of ways don't even like each other very much. So it's not about having the same identity, but it's having the same agenda and then at least getting someone into Congress. And on both state and, and local level, we had, I think, even more success. We got some progress on rent control in my home state through a class alliance between those two groups. So, yeah, it's useful to think in that sort of space, I think. work. So, uh, speaking about attention and tools, one of the main strategies today to get attention within attention from users is gamification. Sorry, yes. Is gamification? Yeah. yeah. So, that's one a very bad strategy and tool and tactics for me because it represents what the capital does to extract value from the attention of people. But I would like to know if, in your opinion, is a valuable strategy to use in our digital tools in order to work against capital tools. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And, and um, the games became a huge part of uh, the culture industry. I wrote a book about that in 2007 for Game Theory. Uh, so I think it's interested in that. And I think about games as forms that say something about form again, right? Like media studies. Games say something about the form of. I, I don't love the, the idea of like neoliberal, but, it, but you know, a better word for I think is gamification. Uh, like if, if, if you don't want to buy my argument that this is worse than capitalism, so it, it might make more sense to call it gamified information capitalism. Because uh, it's that sense of. Uh, being able to break down um, uh, holding your attention to a task somebody else wants done because you'll get symbolic rewards for it and where you're then encouraged to compete with somebody else for that symbolic reward. So, I'm going to use Twitter as an example because I waste all my time on Twitter. I'm like, oh, what will get me more followers? Why did I just lose followers? 
how, how I made this tweet go viral. We were just looking at numbers, as if what made a good tweet was that 2,000 people uh, liked it or recirculated it or something. So you sort of gamify information in that sense. But that doesn't serve anybody's interest other than, in this case, Twitter, yeah, or, or some other branch of the vector or class. That's sort of like keeping you engaged um, because you think it's a game and you're competing against somebody else. Uh, I think the thing to, to sort of um, uh, emphasize about that is we're all pretty clear that this game is kind of rigged, that, you know, all of the ways we're supposed to pass through life become gamified, but there's no level playing field. It's not really fair. Somebody else seems to get, like, big advantages in that that you don't. So I think to sort of undermine that a little bit from within in terms of uh, we're told it's a level playing field, but it's really not. We don't all come into this sort of gamified world. Uh, and we don't all have to think we're sort of individual uh, competitors against each other. Yeah? I don't know if Squid Game is up here, the, the television show, uh, but it's part of a whole genre uh, that views you know, what I'm calling vectorism or late capitalism, call what you like, as a sort of battle royale to the death. But how do we not think like that? Um, how do we think that it's not in anybody's interest to participate in that? becomes kind of key, I think. So what are, what are other forms of collective belonging that might offer other models? My next book's about race. This is about to me seem like a nice example. Of, right, I've been in those years. <laughs> What are ways we can be together that aren't that? And one example is race. Not everybody's case, I know, but you know, one can think of others. Okay, so that's going to be that we run out of time. I know that there were some questions, but maybe we can yeah, do it uh, after the talk. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for being here for your questions. Thank you very much, Mackenzie, for this two amazing conversation with us in Barcelona. Hopefully, we can have you again soon. Yeah? It would be my pleasure. <laughs> thank you all for that question. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Sí, sí. Uh, muchísimas gracias a todos. Solo, solo para cerrar, thank you, Mackenzie, thank you, Alexandra, to be here. It's a, it has been a pleasure. Uh, solo recordaros que mañana continuamos con The Civil Fest a las 9 de la mañana. Tenemos una sesión súper completa uh, de experiencias de extensión de Civil en todo el mundo, de prototipado, de desarrollo, de experimentación, de innovación. Están pasando gracias a The Civil, que recuerdo es una infraestructura abierta, libre y también democrática que estamos intentando construir uh, desde aquí y con muchas comunidades y mucha gente en el mundo y que esperamos también que abra caminos también en, en este nuevo hacer de la tecnología con la gente, desde la gente y para la gente. Muchas gracias, agradecer a todo el equipo, a todo el equipo, a toda la gente que habéis participado y hasta mañana y hasta la próxima.